Hey, what's going on? And welcome to another episode of the Phoenix Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Shane Hubbard. And today's episode is going to be all about my backstory. So for the longest time, I haven't really been interested, or I should say, willing to share my backstory. And it has nothing to do with privacy. It's just for the longest time, my content goal was to generate more business. And now that it's not that, I think that talking about more casual topics that aren't related to lead generation or getting people into my business are going to pop up more and more. And I'm going to feel more comfortable talking about them because for the longest time, my thought process was, well, who cares? Who cares about my story? Who cares about my background? It's not going to matter to them. And that still might be the case and that's fine. But now I'm more comfortable sharing it because it's just not something I, I, uh, it's not something I care about as a, in, in the scope of like owning a business and all that stuff. So anyway, we're going to talk about where I started in fitness and I'm sure we'll jump into several rabbit holes about some of the things that I failed to do uh, very early on that can hopefully provide value to you as somebody who's still building their fitness journey or maybe uh, trying to recapture your fitness journey. So um, we're going to talk about that and we'll kind of dive into different topics. I don't have any like things written down for this because it is just my story. So we'll we'll start in high school. So I've always been an athlete from the age of four until probably I was 22. I was playing some sort of sport, whether it was recreation or organized. And my sport of choice, or I guess the one that I was the, the most uh, adept at was baseball. And while I played other sports like basketball and and I never really played football and a couple of other sports, I baseball was always the one that I had the most promise in. And so from the age of four until high school, I was basically one of the best athletes in my league. Now, the competition, you know, looking back in retrospect, wasn't very high. I was the best in the league of, of people that really there was like, you know, an average set of players. And you could probably count on one hand all of the quote unquote elite players at that age group. And so I had a very inflated idea of how good I was. I mean, I was good. Don't get me wrong. I was a very gifted athlete physically. Um, I had a lot of just instinctual ability within athletics that I think really flourished in baseball specifically because it is very much a, a mental game and a, as well as a physical game. Um, and so I excelled very well for a really long time, but fitness was really never on my radar until I got to my junior year of high school because sports sort of has fitness built into it. And at that age, you know, four, between four and 14, fitness came along with the sport. It wasn't something that I did on the side. Now, that being said, I did start working out with my dad at the age of 12 in this little garage setup that we had. And while it was much more formal than what you might expect from, you know, someone who's 12, it wasn't anything crazy. It was your basic stuff, your, you know, dumbbell bench pressing. Uh, I don't even think we did a lot of squats and things like that. We mostly did like Smith machine type exercises. And the idea was to build a little bit more strength in the last year of uh, what, what is called majors. So when you turn 12, provided it's the right part of the year, you it's your last year in a certain division. So you want to try to maximize the fact that you just hit puberty for that last year before you move on to the division that was right before essentially going to high school. So that's essentially what I did. And so what was fun about that was, is that I was for the first time, like working out recreationally, but that didn't last very long. And as I transitioned into that age into high school, things changed dramatically. Uh, we did have a dedicated weight room as a part of the baseball team, but the kind of weightlifting that we did wasn't very organized. It was more just a class that we took. It wasn't uh, something that was formally organized like you would be for like a football team in high school. So I didn't really get a lot of secondhand volunteer effort in my weightlifting until I sort of took it on myself. And then a pivotal point in my junior year of high, so high school really created a catalyst for the future for me in terms of fitness, especially independent fitness. So the, my junior year of high school, I quit the baseball team. Um, just as a little bit of context, my freshman year of high school, I made the varsity team. I was a DH for a player who was injured. So that person wasn't hitting. I was DHing for them and they were just playing in the field. And um, that was a really good introduction into varsity. I didn't do very well, but it was a good mid-season introduction. And then the summer of my sophomore year, going into my sophomore year, I did a phenomenal amount of playing. That's the stupidest way I've ever put it. I played phenomenally that summer, which really motivated me for my junior year. 
And then they brought in a, a coach from the outside, someone who I had no familiarity with, who coached in a style that I was familiar with and not a fan of. So when I was playing travel baseball, I had a coach and he was a great coach from a, the sense of education, but he was very much, he very much yelled at his players and didn't, he very much took out some of the frustrations about the thing, mistakes we made and yelled at us for it instead of like coaching us. So he wasn't as much a coach in that respect in the game as he was during practice, but even during practice, he yelled at us. So he very much was interested in, in yelling at us when we made mistakes. And that was probably the start of all of the anxiety that I have today. I certainly don't regret going through that experience in my life because it taught me a lot of different things. But had it never happened, I, I often wonder what my life would be like uh, if that was the case. So anyway, I played for him. And so I was familiar for, with this type of coaching and I was not looking forward to it at all. And sure enough, during my sophomore year of, of high school, I pretty much decided, yeah, I don't want to do another two years of this. If he's the coach, I'm not interested. So, you know, I didn't have a great sophomore baseball year. Um, in fact, I got replaced by another player who was very much uh, playing the political game and the brown nosing game. And the fun thing about that is that I was eventually outshined him in, in the biggest game because of some poor choices that he made that got him uh, that got him suspended, which means he couldn't play in the game. I took his place, hit a triple at Dodger Stadium, one of the best memories of my life. And after that game, I remember spending a week and a half thinking about what I wanted to do. And I told my dad, you know what, I don't want to play baseball anymore. I play baseball for fun. It's an enjoyable game for me. I'm very gifted at it, but there's too much politics involved. There's too much nonsensical uh, variables that contribute to a player playing. And I wasn't interested in that. I, I'm putting it better today than I did back then, but it was a very hard decision to make because I didn't want to let my dad down. And I also knew that that course in my life was coming to an end, which was a hard thing because baseball was my life. In fact, I think that was my AOL username at one point. My life is baseball like 18 or something like that. So the decision was easy for me to make internally, but it was hard for me to conceptualize and, and really live with for a while. So I think the first two years I stopped playing, I was, I was pretty depressed. And there was a lot of reasons why I was depressed. Most of it was self-esteem issues. Um, I had some very severe cystic acne that pretty much eliminated the very little amount of self-esteem that I even had to begin with. And so high school for me is a memory that I, I like to leave a memory. I don't like to think about it very often because not a lot of good came out of that. The one thing that did come out of it was after I quit baseball, my dad told me, he said, you know, I support your decision. I know it was a hard one to make, but you still need to stay physically active. And that was probably the most important thing that my dad, or one of the most important things my dad could have ever done for me, because despite the fact that I wasn't looking forward to staying physically active, because I mean, what teenager doesn't want to just sit on the couch and, you know, watch TV or play video games, it was an important enforcement that he made that I, that I am grateful for to this day, and I will pass down to my children. And I think that's part of being a parent is, you know, putting in place things for your kids that are going to benefit them long after they are, you know, being taken care of by you as a parent. So anyway, uh, my grandfather was uh, very into nutrition and equally into exercise, but I would say that if he had to pick one, he would have picked nutrition. And we'll talk a little bit about how that actually ended up being a detriment to him at the end of his life. It's kind of an interesting story. I found it interesting as I learned more about it. So anyway, he got me into bodybuilding.com and they had a teen section. I still remember the, the teenager that was on the front page. I remember reading it for the first time and I wasn't really interested. You know, I wasn't like, oh my God, this is going to like change my life. But the choice that my dad made was that he was going to start working out with me and start teaching me how to work out. And it, it's not like my dad knew, to, knew a ton, but, you know, he had been in gyms and he had been working out himself, you know, through college and, and later. I still remember him working with a guy, one of our neighbors, and they would work out, I think, every Saturday morning. And they just did, you know, garage workouts with, you know, bench pressing, shoulder pressing, bicep curls, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, he went with me for a while. And then when I got my license which was probably the only motivation I had to get a license. I started going to the gym on my own. And by then it had already been about one to two years in because I got my license my senior year of, of high school. So yeah, about one to two years in. And I started keeping the routine and I started getting really into bodybuilding.com forums, which back then were huge. I mean, that was like the the epicenter of fitness for most people. Um, now you have tons of different things going on, but that was really 
where I got all of my information. That's where I did all of the gym bro diets. That's where I experimented with all the advice on, at the time it was called the warrior diet. So before keto, there was something called a warrior diet and it was extremely low carb, pretty much the exact same uh, replica of keto. And for those that don't know, keto was actually a diet that was designed for uh, people with epilepsy because there were studies that were done on the nutritional effects of, of reducing epileptic symptoms. And one of them was a low carb diet. I don't know the exact reasons why that works from a, a brain standpoint, but uh, before it was the keto diet, it was the warrior diet. And I did that. And I still remember eating everything with like ranch dressing that was high fat and, and low carb. Anyway, so that's where my fitness journey began. And I got really far with just that much information, staying consistent, going to the gym. I was very much in it for the vanity metrics. I was very much in it for looking a certain way. I went through so many iterations of starting a diet, quitting a diet, trying something else. And all of that was, in retrospect, part of the learning experience. And so when I think back to that time in my life and I think about how I coached people, one of my main concerns was trying to help people prevent themselves from going through all the trials and tribulations that I went through as a result of trying all those different diets. I wanted to give everyone a shortcut. And what I failed to learn, again, looking back, was is that a lot of times it's the experience that teaches you the most valuable lessons, not the information or the guidance that you might get from a coach. Now, some people appreciated the, you know, the shortcut and other people were in denial about certain things or, or maybe they were like me. They had to experience it rather than, rather than being told about it. So now if I could go back and coach people, I would say, listen, what do you want to do? you know, and then I'll provide the best information I can. And I will help guide you down that route as opposed to trying to keep people away from keto or, or low carb or whatever. I did it out of good intents, intent. But I think that at the end of the day, many people needed that buy in from themselves as opposed to me opposing the things that they wanted to do. So I graduate high school, I get into my first year of college, and I decide that I want to start studying nutrition as a major. And then I go into my second year of college and I'm getting sort of, I feel like I'm hitting a dead end with what I can learn about nutrition. It feels like everything's just about macros. Everything's just about, you know, how to lose fat, all these different things, calories in, calories out, all extremely valuable information. But I also felt like there was something missing because I was dealing with a lot of gastrointestinal uh, things uh, in my life. One of the main motivators for cleaning up my nutrition was to get rid of my cystic acne. That was the biggest motivator for actually caring about nutrition because before then it was just about how do I fuel myself to build muscle and lose fat? And then it started becoming, well, how do I get rid of all these terrible cystic ac acne you know, bumps that I have all over my face? And I remember my mom took me to an herbalist that was in our neighborhood or not in our neighborhood, but you know, in our city. And he told me how important it was to start eating more fruits and vegetables. And I totally disregarded that information because I, I ate microwavable food. I was a high school student. And, you know, later in college, I was pretty much the same way. I didn't want to go through the effort of eating healthier options. I just didn't. It just felt like so much more work. And I felt like I could have gotten better results not going that route. Anyway, I get into college. I start learning more about nutrition. And I start realizing that the information that I've learned independently is actually surpassing the information that I was learning in college. Long story short, just so you know, all the information that college nutrition courses teach is funded by big food companies like Kellogg's, General Mills. There's probably other ones like Nestle. And interestingly enough, a lot of that funding comes with the caveat that nutrition has to be taught very similar to the way the FDA recommends, you know, like the food pyramid at the time. Now it's my plate. And when you go back to the history of how that all started, you realize that nutritional information that was taught in colleges was directly re related to increasing profits for the companies that were sponsoring and donating money to the colleges uh, directly. So when I started learning more about that, I said, you know what, I'm not interested in learning information that is funded by a company that has financial interest. I want to learn what the truth is. And that's one thing that I've been always grateful for, regardless of how scary a journey it has been, is that I've always been more interested in the truth than I have been in selling information for money. I would, I think that's one of the reasons why I had such a hard time building successful, one of the reasons why I had a success, I had difficulty building successful uh, fitness businesses online and in person because I was willing to make less money if it meant the person was able to get the truth. 
which is one of the reasons why I'm very happy now that this is a hobby and not a full-time job. You learn some lessons harder than others. So I decide that I wanna look into something called the Czech Institute. Paul Czech is the founder of that company and I was turned on to that by a fellow baseball player who was also interested in fitness and nutrition. And he said, you know, Paul Czech's fitness stuff is kind of, you know, not that interesting, but his nutrition stuff is really deep. Like to the point where he talks about the soil that food is grown in and how it impacts the quality of that food and the nutritional density and all this stuff. And I was like, that sounds like somebody who is a no nonsense kind of person who is going to get down to the nitty gritty, has done his research and wants to, you know, share it. So I in, enrolled in, uh, well, first of all, I bought his book. I read it from front to back multiple times. I even remember going to bed as a college student at the recommended time that he had uh, recommended based on all the studies that he had done on sleep and how, you know, the hours between, I think it's like 10 p.m. and midnight is when your brain is, brain is regenerating and then between midnight to like 5 a.m. is when your body is regenerating. And I was like, wow, so if I like really want to get the maximal gains, I need to go to bed at nine. So I was actively going to bed earlier than my brother who was in middle school. <laughs> and I was doing it for the sake of, you know, the experimentation. And I, you know, I was doing all these things and not realizing how much more beneficial it was for me to do them um, because I wasn't really comparing it to any other prior experience. Fast forward to having a daughter, it was extremely valuable in retrospect. So I was experimenting and so I said, I want to take the next step. I want to do his seminars. I want to do his course. So the first course is taught by a pupil of his. Um, you probably know him now as J.P. Spears. Back then, J.P. was, from my understanding, working, still working for the Czech Institute and kind of working on his own thing. And he was slowly branching out into YouTube. And for those that don't know J.P., now he's like one of the most famous political satire YouTubers there is. Uh, so it's kind of been cool to have known him before that and seen him grow. It's it's really cool. JP's one of the coolest guys I've ever met. So JP taught that course. And then the courses two, levels two and three were taught by Paul Check, And that was my real goal. I want to meet the founder. I want to hear from the horse's mouth all these things that he's taught. And so I was looking, really looking forward to that. Little did I know what what was going to come of that, and that's probably the most interesting part of my journey, I would say, so far. So we'll get to that in a second. So the, the course was about $2,400, and I was working a part-time job as a front desk, like fitness, you know, whatever. I just worked the front desk at a gym. It was a country club gym, and uh, so I wasn't making a lot of money. I think I made like $400 a check. So I told my parents that this is what I wanted to do. I told him that eventually if this ended up being beneficial, that I was going to drop out of college and go and do the Czech Institute. And I couldn't be more grateful for my parents' support, despite the logic behind my decision being pretty poor. Like if you think about a degree in um, nutritional science or whatever the degree might be, it's probably exponentially better. I, I know it is exponentially better than the route that I chose, but they had full confidence in me. They trusted me and that is rare, as I'm starting to learn, and it's um, I'm extremely grateful for that. That is, it's hard to put a price tag on how valuable that is, and I definitely get emotional when I think about that because it's uh, it's a level of love that I think not a lot of people get to witness, and that makes me sad. Yeah. <sighs> um. Okay, let's let's move on to the, the to the 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 other the next section. So they they told me they said hey, we know this is pretty expensive. You're working a part-time job and going to school right now. If you can come up with 50% of the cost, we'll match it. So I said, that's amazing. Thank you. And that's what I did. So I raised money for about a year. I think it's been a while since that happened. So I don't really remember, but it took me a while and I saved up the money. And I still remember the moment that I, that I paid for that because it was the most money I had ever spent in a single purchase. And I felt relieved. I felt nervous. I felt excited. And you know, I think within three months I was ready to go down there because that's when the conference was. So the conference was in San Diego. I was staying with my cousin, so I got to cut costs on hotel. And I got there on day one. I was very excited, very nervous. I knew this was a pivotal moment in my life. And so knowing that ahead of time, I was, that's probably what m was most, I was most nervous about. And then what I was going to experience in the next three days was literally changed the course of my life. And I, in retrospect, it was a good thing, but in the moment, it was hell. So I get to the seminar, and before we get into anything that I was expecting to get into, we started talking about belief systems. We started talking about religion. We started talking about the kinds of things that I was not expecting to talk about 
in a course dedicated towards teaching somebody how to be a holistic lifestyle practitioner. I knew it was a part of it, but I didn't realize it was going to be this big of a part. So the first day was eight hours. I think every day was eight hours. And we spent eight hours talking and sort of deconstructing belief systems. For a little bit of context, I was raised Christian in terms of belief systems. I very much was indoctrinated into all of the really hardcore beliefs that you know the Christian religion has. I wouldn't say that my parents were hardcore Christians, meaning like we couldn't do certain things like you know, play certain video games, although that did come up at one point. But the teachings and the things that I had learned in Christianity were very much like I took very seriously. And so to have that entire belief system deconstructed without really knowing it on a conscious level was subconsciously whatever the opposite of brainwashing is. So deconstructing what I had been brainwashed into believing. And I say brainwashed, which might be a strong word, because I, I think that everyone that was teaching me in churches about the Christian religion really believed in it as a good thing. So I don't think it was a, a manipulative thing, but it still was very strict beliefs that probably should not be taught to kids that are that impressionable. So anyway, all of that was being deconstructed. And as the seminar went on, I could start to feel myself feeling like very sick to my stomach. And I went home that night and it was hard to go to sleep. My mind was racing a, a thousand miles an hour. Yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't a great experience. So anyway, I wake up the next morning and it's the same thing again. And I'm I'm exhausted. My, my, <clears throat> excuse me. My stress level is through the roof. I feel like everything that I had come to believe in my life was being questioned and debunked. And it started to feel like I didn't exist. As weird as that might sound, it started to feel like my life as I knew it was a dream. And I remember going home that night and I, I text my parents and I'm saying, I don't know what's going on with this thing, but this is not what I had signed up for. That night was one of the worst nights that I've ever had. I woke up I think I went to bed at like 9 p.m. I woke up at midnight and my mind was just racing. Like I couldn't stop thinking. It felt like my brain was just on caffeine. I couldn't settle down. My, my cortisol levels, my stress hormone was through the roof. I was panicking. I was shaking. It was weird because it was totally involuntary. Um, I, I wasn't trying to think about these things. I wasn't trying to obsessively and compulsively, you know, try to reason with this stuff. My brain was just like, trying to understand what was happening. It was almost like I was being rewired. And I remember all the next day, I didn't go to the, to the seminar that day. I remember walking to a Whole Foods down the street and just like panicking. And so I called my mom and I was like, I don't know what's going on. Like, I'm, this is scary. Like, I have no idea what's going on. And she goes, okay. And so she is an excellent listener. I think I've learned all of my listening skills from her because she can just sit and listen and then provide feedback, but allow you space to communicate. And so I was talking to her and I was talking to her and I said, you know what? I'm now I'm starting to physically not feel good. I was starting to get nauseous. I was getting a headache. It felt like I was getting the flu. And so I told him, he said, no, I'm going to come home because me being here in this state is, is not worth it. So I text my cousin and said, Hey, you know, I don't, nothing crazy is happening, quote unquote, but I've decided to opt out of the, the seminar. I'm going to drive home. I didn't want to scare you guys when you got home and I wasn't there, but I'm, I'm leaving. I'm going home. So I decided to go home. I'm driving there. I'm like inches away from vomiting the entire drive home. And it was about three and a half hours. In fact, I had to pull over at one point and at in and out and take a nap uh, because I couldn't drive. And if you know anything about San Diego to LA traffic, it's just always nuts. So I finally get home and I'm in bed for three days. So I had basically stressed myself into getting sick. On Monday, I go back to work. And for the next two months, I just, I'm just wandering. I'm just wandering around. I have no direction. I'm aimless. I feel betrayed. I feel confused. Everything that I thought that I had locked in just became an absolute, it, it was like a dead end. And I didn't know what to do with my life. After the period of sort of recuperating from that, I decided I still wanted to work in fitness. I still wanted to help people. I still wanted to do whatever I could with my my passion for fitness and nutrition and the information that I had learned. Um, and so I decided instead of going the holistic route, which felt like an absolute nightmare, if this is what it had to be, I decided to become a personal trainer. Now, in the time that I was between college uh, working at the gym 
I had an office job and I was working a lot with Excel and food manufacturing and things like that. So I was making money and pretty good money for my age. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to just follow this as long as I can. And then I got let go from that job. And I took my unemployment and I decided, you know what, I'm going to take this money and invest it into personal training certification. I'm going to pass the test and I'm going to become a personal trainer. So that's what I did. And I decided at that time to move out of LA and move to central California where it was way less expensive to just exist on the earth. And so that's what I did. And I still live here. And I worked in personal training at a commercial gym for about a year before I realized uh, this was going nowhere fast. And so then I found another gym in town uh, and the owner had the exact same certification that I had, which is very rare. I had never met anyone else with that certification. So I knew that his growth mindset was in a very similar place that I was. And he sort of agreed with, he didn't take the level two that I had taken, but he agreed that some of the other stuff that, that Paul Cech taught was beyond what he was interested in learning about, or at least implementing into his business. So I worked there for a little while. When the pandemic hit, I decided to move on from that job for lots of different reasons. And now I'm working as the manager of marketing communications for a nonprofit blood bank. And I am continuing to pursue my own personal fitness without coaching clients. I do have one friend of mine who I do personal training sessions with in my garage two days a week. And that's, that's fun. You know, it's better than doing nothing. And it's, it still keeps me in the loop with what's going on. But yeah, that's my story. I mean, I, I could probably spend more time on different parts of it. One of the things I want to do in future episodes is just talk about all the mistakes I made along the way. And I call them mistakes because it's an easy label, but you could also put them off as learning lessons, natural learning lessons in the progression of trying to improve your health for the sake of potentially saving you time in your own personal journeys. And if nothing else, just reminiscing about my own journey uh, in the past. You know, one thing I think that this episode did for me personally was just provide a sort of a cathartic experience kind of going through certain things and and what I've been through in those regards. And I, I don't mean to make things sound more dramatic than they are, but I do want to make them accurate to how my experience of them was. And when I look back at that experience at the holistic lifestyle coaching, I don't regret the experience uh, because I think that it fundamentally pushed me in a direction that was better for my overall pursuit of the truth. So while it was very pain, you know, one of the things that I like to think about is that the degree that something is painful, it is also probably valuable. You can't say that about everything. If you were an abused child, the value is not ever going to exceed the abuse. But for voluntary experiences that you put yourself through that are painful, that are life-changing, but that don't kill you, are usually more valuable in the long run than they were in the short term in terms of pain. So I don't regret the experience. I totally lost what I was going to say. I don't regret the experience, but it is a difficult memory to call up. I should, let's just say that. And uh, I think ultimately it, it taught me that the pursuit of truth is always the best option. There's obviously times where truth is not the best option, at least in the short term. But in the long term philosophy, you know, we're living in a world right now where the truth is more obscure than what you're made to believe. And so the more that you can pursue the truth and the more that you can become a part of the collective whole that wants to pursue the truth, the stronger the truth will be to those that are innocent and don't yet know the truth. So I've sort of inadvertently taken it upon myself to put the truth before myself which is another reason, one, one of the reasons why I, I enjoy fitness so much is because there's so much bull crap out there. And the only reason I'm not cussing is because then I have to figure out where I cussed and then label this an explicit podcast. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just label them all explicit and just say words like fuck and shit and all that stuff. So you already did it. But if there's one lesson that I've learned, one life lesson that I've learned about fitness is it's that pursuing the truth is always worth it even if the road is extremely difficult in increments. So like there were a lot of times where I sacrificed business because I was willing to tell my clients the truth and I wasn't putting a ton of time and energy into the marketing of things that could have been spun in a certain way. So like my marketing for my fitness business was pretty boring. And whether that was inexperience or subconsciously by design, I always felt like 
if I told you the truth, that would mean more to you than it would me selling you lies. 